Welcome everybody to the MyTech Bonsai Talk uh, today. We have Ellen Weinberg here, who's a docent and volunteer with um, Arnold Arboretum. And she knows quite a bit about bonsais and will teach us all about the history and the art and uh, some of the science of uh, bonsais. And um, so Ellen, I'll have you take it away with the joys and magic um, and art of bonsai. All right, uh, welcome everybody on a sunny, warm afternoon. Uh, let me start trying to set up my share screen. And looks as though uh, we're good. Um, all right, I'm assuming everybody can see me. If not, um, send a note on your chat, okay? Yeah, Anyways, um, welcome again. I am a volunteer at the Arnold Arboretum. I have a small specialty in the bonsai area, but I, um, I have a couple of disclaimers. Uh, number one is I am not an expert at growing bonsai. I've actually um, been very successful at killing a couple myself. Uh, also, the uh, volunteers don't take care of or even touch uh, the bonsais. That's all um, up to the uh, greenhouse um, and uh, specialty staff at the uh, Arnold uh, Arboretum. Uh, the second disclaimer is, is more of an invitation. Um, seeing a slideshow is lovely, uh, but it's nothing like seeing the real thing. So when the, um, when the opportunity arises after the COVID-19 issue and the bonsais are back in their display house, I highly invite you all to come take a look at them, be able to walk around them, get a sense of their size. Um, being in the presence of a tree that's been cultivated for over 250 years is really an amazing thing. So let's get started. So why is Arnold Arboretum's collection important? Um, numbers wise, it's not, it's not huge. We have uh, perhaps 45 bonsais. It's located in a fairly obscure area of the uh, Arboretum. Um, and it's not uh, something that's um, integrated uh, into an overall Japanese themed area. The reason it's important is that we um, obtained uh, trees from a donation of, um, from Lars Anderson of plants that came to the United States in 1913. As far as we know, there is only one other facility in the United States that has had bonsais under cultivation as long as we have, and they have a much smaller number. We think the Brooklyn Botanical Garden has two plants that came over at about the same time. But ours have been on the U.S. soil longer than any other plants. Certainly, um, uh, 1913 was not the first time that bonsais came to the U.S. Um, after uh, Japan was opened in the late 1860s, uh, they, they were um, transported to the United States. And there's evidence in the 1876 Philadelphia Centennial Exposition uh, that a Camerocypris obtusa, which is similar to what we have, was on display at their Japanese uh, pavilion. And even in Boston in 1899, there was a uh, there was a, an auction of these dwarf trees, but we don't have any record that any of these plants have survived. So who was Lars Anderson? Uh, this uh, picture shows a, a really lovely portrait of uh, Lars Anderson and his wife, uh, Isabel Weld Perkins. Lars uh, Anderson was born in 1866 um, to an already wealthy family. Uh, he dropped out of Harvard Law School and a family uh, friend, uh, Robert Todd Lincoln, yes, the son of uh, Abraham Lincoln, um, helped him get a uh, position in the diplomatic corps. 
He was first in London, and then he had a position in the embassy in Rome. Uh, at that time, he met his um, uh, soon-to-be uh, fiance, Isabel Well uh, Perkins. Uh, he then left the embassy in Rome. They were married in 1897. Um, Lars and his wife bought a, a really substantial property in uh, Brookline that they named Weld for obvious reasons. Uh, this was over 68 acres of land. Uh, this was actually just the summer home for the couple. Uh, their main uh, home was in the uh, DuPont Circle area in Washington, D.C., and it still exists as a, um, a museum. Um, after they had been uh, married for a while, Lars returned as minister to Belgium in 1911 and, uh, to 1912. And then in 1912 to 1913, he was appointed ambassador to Japan, really only for a very short period of time, six months. Um, this may have, uh, he resigned um, allegedly uh, because of the uh, transfer from the Taft administration to the Wilson administration. Uh, the Andersons did not have any children, and they developed um, a very lovely Japanese garden in 1907 before he um, uh, went over to uh, Japan as ambassador. Um, so he already had a, um, a long interest in um, uh, Japanese um, uh, uh, arts, arts and uh, botany. Um, just before uh, Lars Anderson left uh, Japan, he purchased approximately 40 trees from the Yokohama Nursery in Japan. This was a well-known uh, large nursery that published lovely catalogs. We think that these were shipped by boat to, first to the west coast and then by uh, rail to the uh, east coast. Uh, this would have taken at least um, a month and a half to as much as three months. And remarkably, it, the records indicate that 39 out of the 40 trees survived. Uh, the trees were established at, the, at their Brookline estate in the already uh, developed Japanese gardens. And occasionally they were uh, displayed by the public. Our next slide shows a lovely uh, cover from the Yokohama Nursery. This was a 1901 cover. And uh, we're uh, pleased at the Arboretum to have uh, several copies of the Yokohama uh, nursery catalogs, all with this uh, gorgeous um, uh, painting. This is a, um, a display uh, that the Andersons did at, um, in 1933. This was at the New England Spring Flower Show. Um, I understand, and it may be this little sign here that it may it won a gold medal. And also, I think that this plaque um, may uh, indicate that that was a plant that was given to them by the Emperor of uh, Japan. Uh, that plant at that time was already 70 years old. Um, however, unfortunately, it, it, it did not survive the uh, test of time. So Lars uh, died in uh, 1937. Um, about six months after his death, his wife donated the first 30 of his uh, dwarf trees, uh, bonsai, to the uh, arboretum. Um, fortunately, she included some funds uh, to build a shade house uh, for display. Um, when she died in 1948, the remaining nine plants uh, were donated to us. Um, and then what happened to their, to their um, home in Brookline? Well, it became the Lars Anderson Park after donation of the entire property in 1949. Um, I've been told that if you go to the uh, park, I haven't done this myself, but there are a few large trees, some granite steps, um, and uh, maybe um, one other piece of sculpture that still survived from where the Japanese garden used to be. The original uh, laugh house uh, that was built for the donation was at the old Bossy Institution. Uh, this is now the grounds of the University of Massachusetts Medical uh, Laboratories. 
Um, un unfortunately, the Arboretum lacked knowledge knowledgeable garter gardeners at that time to care for the plants. You also have to realize that the donations were made in the middle of the uh, depression with World War II uh, looming uh, just over the horizon and uh, personnel and funds were uh, sorely uh, lacking. This is a plaque uh, on the original 1938 uh, building. And on it, you'll see that these were um, donated in memorial to um, Lars Anderson's friend, Charles Sprague's sergeant. Uh, sergeant is, is a huge entity at the Arboretum. He was the uh, first director from uh, 1872 all the way to um, 1927. Um, so although he didn't receive the, the trees, the uh, Andersons and um, uh, Sergeant knew each other. This is a display of the uh, Lath House, the original one that was at the Bussey Institution. Um, the construction, um, you'll notice when I show later, pictures of the walls and the ceiling are actually not all that different than what we have today. Uh, the lath house is open to the elements um, and it appears as though visitors were able to at least walk around the uh, sides of the uh, pavilion to view the, uh, the plants. Our current lath house uh, was built in 1962 um, when the Dana greenhouses were built. Um, and then fortunately in 1969, we obtained um, some expertise in bonsai uh, care and management. Uh, Connie Derdarian uh, joined us. Um, she already had at least 10 years of bonsai experience, had already given some uh, classes at the Arboretum, and she immediately began um, uh, revitalizing the collection. She also donated some really beautiful uh, specimens to the uh, collection. This is where the um, current um, bonsai pavilion is located, and I'll just orient you a little bit. This uh, obviously is Center Street. Uh, with the center street gate uh, but up at the top here would be the arbor way and the Hunnewell building um, so you could access the um, bonsai collection either through the uh, linden path or down meadow road and this is up uh, uh, higher than the um, uh, shrub collection there's actually a set of stairs at the back and you can see the uh, top of the bonsai pavilion from um, the shrub level it's just a picture of uh, Connie uh, Dardarian uh, doing some root pruning on um, one of our um, uh, Chabo Hivas. This was a Lars Anderson uh, donation. Connie uh, retired in uh, 1984, and then uh, Peter Del Tradici became our curator, and now Steve Schneider, who is also our director of operations, is the curator. We had um, an unfortunate episode in 1986. Over a Columbus Day uh, weekend, there was a robbery, and six plants were stolen including three of the original uh, Japanese maples brought over in 1913. Um, the wood, which uh, was getting old and starting to rot, was immediate re immediately replaced and an alarm system installed. Um, but really no public uh, had access to the interior uh, lath house until um, fairly recently. So the lath house was um, renovated in uh, 2014 and reopened, if I uh, recall, in uh, the spring of 2015. And several things um, were done to improve uh, um, access and um, care for the plants. Um, several um, of the struts were taken out of the top of the lath house to allow um, more airflow and sunshine uh, uh, to the plants. The plants were located to the exterior of the um, um, lath house, allowing people to congregate and care to occur from the central portion. 
and each plant um, was put onto its individual uh, pedestal. Um, the next um, uh, uh, thing that we'll talk about is um, how the um, collection um, has increased over the years. Uh, so first of all, we had uh, 39 uh, plants come to us in donation. Um, of those, uh, at, at, the, uh, at the moment, 14 are surviving. Um, these include six of the big um, uh, conifer Camisipris obtusa, uh, subspecies Chabo uh, heba. Uh, the plants that were donated were now 150 to uh, 280 years old. They, some of them were already old at the time they were imported to the U.S. About 30 additional plants have been added over the years. Uh, we had a um, we had the pleasure of getting a recent acquisition of 10 plants or so in 2015. Uh, these came to us from a gentleman named Marty Klein, um, pertinent to our um, uh, our guests uh, for this lecture today. Are that uh, Marty is an MIT trained MIT trained uh, engineer. Um, one would ask, well, why don't we have more plants? Well, we're pretty limited um, for both care and uh, display currently. The main lath house for display um, usually has approximately 12 uh, specimens in it. We have an additional lath house that's adjacent to the Dana greenhouse um, and um, uh, that has space for the remaining uh, plants in the, in the uh, collection and they occasionally are, are rotated into the uh, display house, uh, particularly uh, seasonally. This is um, a really lovely uh, picture of how the new uh, construction and display is of the lath house. So again, each plant is on an individual uh, pedestal uh, the pedestals can be uh, rotated to make sure they get the correct exposure uh, from the sun, although we, we don't allow volunteers or public to do that. Um, when the lath house is open, you can walk all the way around the circumference outside, and we have these nice open uh, windows here uh, to view through, uh, but also have the security uh, precautions where the this can be closed up uh, in the evening or off hours and there is a state-of-the-art security system uh, now um, in place. On um, Tuesday, or excuse me, Thursday mornings and Sunday mornings when there is a volunteer available, which is not currently, uh, we do open the, um, the lath house to visitors to come inside and uh, get up close and personal uh, with, the, uh, with the bonsais. I'm going to talk a little bit about the art and science of caring for our collection. Again, I'm not an expert, but I, I do have a, a general understanding. And um, if you do have any questions about that I can't answer, I will uh, try to bring that to a, um, uh, one of our experts and see if we can get you uh, an answer. Let's talk about some definitions. So bonsai is the uh, Japanese tradition of displaying dwarf trees, and um, it's predated by the Chinese uh, art of displaying dwarf trees. And this is in, for the Chinese art, is called penjing. Um, penjing also refers to more of a, a landscape than just a single tree, although it can include just a single tree. Um, this is a, a pretty good example of it. Um, this is a, a well-known um, uh, Penjing uh, expert, and uh, this is a, the cover of a book. And on it, um, you can see there are several trees, um, a sensation that there's water over here, as well as a small horse. Um, the Chinese uh, Penjing art dates with some evidence to the sixth century. And the uh, Japanese have evidence of uh, starting work with bonsais in approximately the 8th century. So very old for both of them. 
So how do you start a bonsai tree? Well, initially, or originally, uh, bonsais were started from existing plants. They were often taken out of the wild, maybe on a windswept uh, mountainside or next to the seashore, uh, looking for plants with um, a, a unusual shape and uh, sometimes even dwarfing that occurred uh, naturally. Uh, that's of course now frowned upon. Um, in most places it would be illegal to remove plants either off of uh, um, uh, somebody else's property or out of uh, federal or state lands. So bonsais are really started the same way we would start any other plants, from seeds, uh, from cuttings. Uh, we take cuttings from um, our bonsai all the time uh, by layering and uh, by grafting. So what makes a bonsai small? So first of all, I want to let you know that bonsais are not genetically different than the trees that you have in your yard or the arboretum has in their landscape. And our um, second director of uh, curator of the uh, uh, bonsai collection had did a wonderful experiment. And this is present just outside the display lath house um, where you can see it currently at the arboretum. Um, Peter uh, Del Tradici in uh, 1979 um, planted a, an already 10 year old cutting that had been taken from one of the original um, Lars Anderson Chabohibas. Um, and he placed it outside the uh, lath house. And then in uh, 1984, it suddenly developed a, um, a, a new leader that was characteristic of the original uh, plant, kind of loose and feathery. And now it is uh, over 15 feet tall and looks just like any other um, Camacyprus in the, um, in, at the facility. So bonsais are artificially remain small due to training. They're confined to shallow pots. They have to be root pruned. They are branch pruned and often leaf pruned. talk a little bit about uh, root pruning. Um, so a, a tree or a shrub growing in the, in the, in the landscape or uh, in the wild is going to have a, a large root spread, often two to three times uh, past the drip line of the plant. Well, that's certainly not possible with a bonsai. They're all in relatively small uh, shallow pots where the roots are very uh, restricted. Uh, so therefore, they have to be repotted um, about every three to five years. This depends on the species and on the individual uh, tree. Um, this can be a major undertaking. Uh, this is a picture of one of our oldest and biggest of the Chabohibas. It probably weighs uh, 300 pounds or so if you include the potter's soil, and um, it's being moved by forklift. Once the uh, trees are taken out of their container and either put into a new container or returned to, to the original, the, uh, the roots are teased out and they are uh, cut back so that um, new uh, soil can be placed um, around the, uh, the roots to uh, rejuvenate the uh, plant. Um, however, the, the soil that's used for a bonsai is not typical garden soil, nor is it even potting soil that you might get at uh, Home Depot. Um, it's usually made up of um, something called akadama, which is a uh, hard baked uh, Japanese clay, maybe some pumice, uh, some fine gravel, gravel and organic uh, compost. So it's uh, um, free draining and moisture retentive, uh, retentive which sounds um, uh, like they're um, uh, opposites, but uh, it, it works beautifully for these uh, plants. So that's, that was root pruning. So branch and leaf pruning, um, branch and leaf pruning, particularly branch pruning is done um, for two reasons. Uh, the first reason to prune branches off entirety or uh, parts of them is for formative pruning. And this is to develop the overall shape of the plant. The shape of our um, 
Chavo Hebas are described as cloud-like but conical, um, maybe representative of uh, Mount uh, Fuji. So the the uh, bonsai expert has in mind what final shape they're going to try to arrive at, which can take years uh, to get to that point. And of course, there's also maintenance pruning. Uh, this is done to restrict the natural growth. So um, this depends on um, whether it's a conifer or deciduous. So the spring, uh, vigorous spring growth of a deciduous tree is uh, removed um, uh, fairly early, uh, conifers a little bit later in the season, and then updating um, during the uh, summer. There's also a way to ensure small leaves done occasionally on Japanese uh, trees like Japanese maples. Um, uh, all of the uh, leaves are, are removed and the plant pushes out a second growth of leaves and the size of those leaves are often much smaller than the originals. Uh, as you can imagine, um, all of this can be a stressor on the, um, on the plant. This is an example of some traditional Japanese uh, styles for, uh, uh, for bonsai trees. And this is, uh, I took out of a book, Bonsai Basics by uh, Pessy and Sampson. And I want you to take a particular look at this uh, king guy uh, because we have, uh, this is an Atlantic cedar and in the king guy style. And this is one of the arboretums of plants and it is just uh, spectacular. And when this gets repotted, they actually have to wire the, um, the lower trunk and root ball into position because um, initially until it reestablishes because the weight of this plant um, could uh, pull the whole thing out of the uh, pot. Uh, wiring is also done on almost all bonsais. Um, many of you may have seen this. We certainly have um, uh, good examples of this um, every year at the Arboretum. So uh, wires are placed on plants to help with that formative uh, shape. Um, are often used to move uh, branches from an upright to a lateral or even a, a down uh, position. The attempt to make the uh, plant wider than tall and also to uh, promote uh, age. So copper wires are wrapped around the uh, thinner uh, branches and then they can be bent. Um, and um, tension wires um, can go from the trunk or the pot uh, to hold a thicker branch in place where a bend is needed. Uh, this is a picture of, let me get his name right here, uh, June Imabayashi, and I apologize to him if I have, um, if I have messed up his, the pronunciation of his name. Uh, June is our expert at uh, bonsai care at the Arboretum, um, but he, he really is um, integral to the New England Bonsai Garden um, uh, Center, a place where you actually can purchase bonsais. Uh, he is Japanese and has been trained by uh, three bonsai masters. Um, this picture is demonstrating a couple of things. Uh, you can see the wiring on the thinner branches. And by the way, this is a lilac. Uh, so we're at the Arboretum, we're, we're, we're trying to shape some new, new um, shrubs and, and trees that you might not normally think of as bonsais. So, there, so here's the uh, copper wiring. And then there appears to be a thicker wire uh, here around the trunk, and that may be there um, to support a uh, tension wire. Uh, this is an azalea, um, just coming into uh, full bloom. And uh, again, you can see the, um, the uh, wires uh, wrapping around the thinner branches to try to uh, bend them uh, into uh, position. And this is a, um, a picture of some uh, pruning and bonsai care that's actually going on in, um, uh, in the uh, lath house. Um, uh, this uh, appears to be um, one of our bald cypress, and I, I'm not sure if you can see it, but almost all of these branches have been wired 
and pulled into a down position. And this um, pine um, appears to be uh, trimmed and maybe some work going on with uh, soil replenishment. So how do, you, how do you take care of a plant that is growing in a small, uh, sh often shallow uh, pot? Well, watering is critical. Um, and uh, particularly in this hot uh, uh, weather that we're having. Um, Overwatering is actually more deadly than underwatering, uh, which is the reason that the soil is so uh, free draining, but it does mean then the, when the weather is warm that the plants have to be checked frequently and they're often watered uh, three times a day. Uh, if you have an opportunity to see the uh, bonsais um, up close and personal in our lath house, you'll like, in the summertime, you'll likely see one of the uh, uh, greenhouse staff members coming in periodically uh, to check the soil for dryness. Uh, um, the uh, staff does use uh, fertilizer, both um, organic and inorganic. Um, last uh, few years, we've been uh, using it as a dry material applied over the surface of the uh, soil, uh, often in uh, little baskets that when water uh, comes into the baskets, the nutrients are released into the soil. And as in all plants, um, pest control is um, unfortunately often necessary. Um, and the Arboretum does try very hard to use natural products such as uh, beneficial uh, insects uh, for uh, control. Although most of our plants are uh, cold hardy, most of our bonsai are cold hardy, and as a matter of fact, they're uh, cousins, if you will, um, of normal size, sit out obviously in the landscape all winter in um, freezing temperatures and with snowpack. Um, but we don't do that with uh, the bonsai. Uh, first of all, the freeze thaw uh, would be uh, harmful to the pots. Um, usually they'll crack over time. And we also don't want a chance to snow load and, and the ice uh, build up on the plants. So they do come into a um, underground storage facility. Uh, the temperature is just above freezing, maybe 33 to 36 degrees. It's dark in there most of the time unless the plants are being checked on. Um, they are checked for uh, watering needs uh, at least every few days. Um, and then they are um, uh, brought into the cold storage pretty consistently late November, maybe just after Thanksgiving, early December. This has extended a little bit with global warming. Uh, but emergence in spring is very weather uh, dependent. Um, you really want to avoid um, exposing um, uh, new growth to freezing temperatures. Um, if many of you are gardeners, you know that um, when we get a sudden um, below uh, uh, freezing uh, evening in uh, late April, April or early May, it really can damage uh, the um, uh, foliage. Uh, our, generally, the deciduous plants are, are brought out first, and then the uh, conifers. This is a picture of the underground uh, storage facility with uh, somebody checking on the condition of the plants. And you can see, obviously, they're, uh, they're uh, still uh, uh, green and um, appear healthy, but you can also see that uh, the deciduous plants here are in um, uh, are, are in their winter lack of foliage. So I'm going to show you a few more uh, pictures uh, of our bonsai specimens. Um, like you all, uh, access to, the, uh, to a lot of the things we enjoy is uh, difficult this time of year uh, with, uh, with COVID-19. So that they're, I'm missing um, some start dates on the plants. So there's a difference between a start date and an accession date. An accession date is when the plant was acquired by the Arboretum, but the plant could have been 100 years old uh, when it was acquired. Uh, so you'll see I have some dates that are accession dates, and I have some plants with no dates, and I have some plants with start dates, and I apologize for that. Uh, so this first uh, plant, and this is just spectacular uh, when, you, when you see it in person, 
is um, a Chinese elm, Ulmus parvifolia, and it has this um, hollow, hollow area in its trunk, and yet it is entirely uh, vigorous. And if you were to see the plant from the other side, the trunk looks normal on that side. And we received this in 1990, but it was, it's older than, than that. Uh, this is one of our older uh, Camacyphrus obtusa, uh, the Chabohiba. We do know that this one was started in uh, 1787. Um, this plant, um, this picture I think is from around 2005, 2006. So the plant has um, uh, had quite a bit of rejuvenation from this, from that time. And when you see it um, um, in person, these um, uh, needle areas are fuller and denser uh, than they are in this picture, but really stunning. And size-wise, this is probably uh, three and a half feet wide by about three feet tall. Here's two Japanese uh, maples that were part of the original uh, Lars Anderson um, uh, collection. And they are in their fall foliage. Um, as a docent, I get this question all the time, do they change color? And absolutely, they change color. And this is a beautiful example. Um, and, uh, and, they, and they meet the rest of the landscape. So some years we have better foliage color than others and our bonsai are the same way. This was a great year when this picture was taken. This is uh, a closer look of one of the bald uh, cypresses. Um, so um, uh, the bald cypress is a US native. Um, it's normally found in the southeast, although it is hardy to our uh, climate, even to 5B, a little colder than this. Um, and um, it is uh, deciduous, so even though it's a conifer, it, le it loses its um, uh, needles in the fall, uh, turns a nice golden color, and then those uh, grow uh, again in the, um, uh, back in the spring. The other uh, known uh, plant for that is uh, uh, the larch. Uh, this is a, a Coralopsis spicata, which is really a, um, uh, can gr be grown um, primarily as a shrub. Uh, this is an early uh, spring picture, and you can see it's little racemes that are going to be quite a bit longer are just starting uh, to come out, and I don't have a start date for this one. This is um, Pinus parv parviflora, Japanese pine. Um, this was a Connie Derdarian um, uh, uh, donation, and it really is so interesting because the trunk is actually growing right along a crevice in uh, the rock here, this very porous or tufa type of rock. And uh, we received this plant in 1986, although it was older, certainly, uh, than uh, shown. Um, at that at the time we received it, and here is our um, our oldest of the um, uh, uh, plants from the uh, Lars Anderson collection. It's um, uh, one of the Chabohibas, and we still have this one, even though this is again an older picture. Uh, this was started in 1737, so when these were imported in 1913, it was already uh, old. Uh, very likely came from a Buddhist uh, temple in Japan um, and then acquired by the uh, nursery uh, which, when Japan uh, mar modernized in the um, late 1800s and uh, early um, uh, 20th century. Um, there was kind of a, a rush to get rid of some of these um, older, what now would be considered national uh, treasures, but at the time you, you could acquire these for um, an affordable sum, which is hard to believe at this point. So, and that's the, that's the end of the lecture. Let me see if I can uh, turn this off and take any uh, questions. Okay, try to get gallery view going here.
Do we want to go over any questions? If anyone has any questions, they can just drop them right in the chat. We are gonna, oh, here we go. Okay, um, Ruth asks, when can we come to see the bonsai in person? Do we have any thoughts on when that might be able to happen? Is Cheryl, is Cheryl White on? Uh, let's see, I, I, did, I saw her earlier, but it doesn't look like she's here right now. So I don't have an answer for that. I'm not sure she does either. She's uh, from the Arboretum. Um, the best way to check that is to go on to the Arnold Arboretum's website, um, which by the way is spectacular, it's absolutely spectacular. There is more information than you can possibly imagine on that website and they will, um, they'll be able to um, uh, let you know when that, that's um, uh, uh, going to be possible. I hope this fall, but I'd be lying if I told you that's a surety. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we have another question coming in from Tom. Uh, approximately how long does it take to train a tree to the point where you would consider it a bonsai, such as the new trees that, the, that you're currently establishing? Um, I think commonly it would be uh, two to three years. Um, often uh, the uh, plants are grown in a normal sized uh, container while the early training is going on. So that might be for a two year period. And then they're put down, in, they can be put into what's called a training uh, bonsai pot that might be a little bit bigger with a little bit more room for soil. And at that point, it's going to start looking like a bonsai. So usually in about a two to three year period. Great. Uh, another question for all those not so great green thumb plant parents out there. Um, what is a hardy type of bonsai for folks who are maybe have less of a green thumb? Um, I I think uh, I'm trying to make a bonsai uh, right now out of some uh, seedlings I found of evergreens. I think there isn't one that's necessarily easier or harder. Um, I think the problem that we have is storage for the winter. So the thing that kills bonsais that most of us try to grow, and I've, I've had this problem myself, is that I don't know what to do with it in the winter. It doesn't wanna be in your hot, dry house. It really wants to be outside. So um, a deciduous um, a plant that loses its leaves, like a Japanese maple, that you could tuck underneath in, uh, the eaves of the house, uh, maybe surround with a bunch of uh, leaves, or put in an unheated porch or garage might be the way to start but you, you can't forget about it completely in the winter because you do have to give it some water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a, a couple more questions coming in, which is great, everybody keep them coming. Um, along that same note though, uh, are there bonsai plants more suited for indoor versus outdoor? Yeah, I, and I, uh, I think I saw a question coming in. Some of the subtropical or tropical uh, plants um, I've seen hibiscus, I've even seen bougainvillea, which is really a vine. Um, so plants that were, you would normally consider as house plants, but might be tree sized would be better to bring inside in the winter. Great, so those would be ones that are not stored underground. Right, you don't want it, they'll die. So, uh, and they're a little easier because you don't have to worry about that late October, or November through um, freeze spot in our early spring. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes they need less light too, which is good. Uh-huh, yeah, that kind of plays into the next one as well. Um, can you leave tropicals out in the open in the summer or will the direct sun be too harsh? Um, my personal experience is that when you move the plants from the inside your house to outside, you have to acclimate them to both the breezes and the sun. Uh, so you usually start them outside in a, in a protected area um, and gradually get them used to uh, both. But depending on the plant, if they're, and you, and you can find the growing conditions online, if they're not, if they're shade lovers, they probably don't want to be in direct sun. Excellent. And then um, 
one more question, at least for the moment. If anyone else has any more questions, please add them to the chat. Um, this was an excellent presentation and a talk, and we're wondering if there are any other hands-on classes that you would recommend? Um, we don't have any right now at the Arboretum, but we're very privileged to have uh, two, and if I'm missing more, I apologize to, to the facilities, but there's a place called uh, Bonsai uh, West, uh, and um, where, uh, where June Imabayashi is um, uh, employed, um, New England uh, uh, bonsai, uh, that both um, offer classes. I don't know currently, given the situation going on, but they both offer um, hands-on classes. Great, thank you. Yeah, definitely something we can all check out. Um, okay, so typically, Trees gain rings as they grow and circulation develops. Um, does the bonsai process slow the growth of rings? Well, I, I, I've seen them and they're, they're almost, they're there, but you need a, a magnifying lens to, to wow. see them well because they're, they're compact. Great. And then it looks like uh, Gary has just added to the chat a website, um, which has been a great online resource. Terrific. Um, at uh, Mirai Live. Um, great. All right. Any last questions? We're just going to give it one more moment. Saying thank you so much, Ellen. This was an excellent talk. I think we all learned so much about bonsais. I had no idea. Great. Thank you. I hope to see some of you at least next spring, maybe this fall. So. Yeah, that would be excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much to our host, Ellen. Um, and thank you all for coming to the MyTech presentation of the Bonsai Talk. Great. Thank you very much for having me.